morning once again, everybody. It is so good to see everybody. Hi, I introduce myself. My name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Thank you so much. If it's your first time here, thanks for being our guest. It's an honor you chose to come here today. And we also want to welcome everyone that's watching online as well. Can you guys do me a big favor? And all the first-time guests here and everyone online, let them know that you love them and you're missing by being real loud and obnoxious. <laughs> all right. You know, it's so good to see a lot of you start to come back, and I know uh, I've met a couple this morning, and uh, they're a little uh, advanced in age a little bit, and they say, well, Pastor, it's so good to be back. We got our shots, and we're good, and she said, it's not the same being online. It's so much better to be back in the building, and I will tell you, it is better to be back in the building. If you feel comfortable, we'd love to have you come back. Guys, is it better in the building or what? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so... There's something that happens when we join together in a room together and we have two or three are gathered in my name. I've been talking to people. It's been a difficult time this last year. We want to celebrate um, dying to live, right? And so this coming Easter, that's next week, we're having our Easter services on Saturday at 3. And could you guys mind just kind of like, I'm getting smoked out up here. If you don't mind, just turn that down a little bit. That'd be awesome if someone could just kill the smoke machine. That would be awesome. Thank you, guys. How could we do? How could we live without smoke? I don't know. But anyhow, well, <laughs> anyhow, but anyhow, uh, what's, what's going to happen? We're going to have five services, okay? Uh, f- uh, Three o'clock and four thirty p.m. this coming weekend, and then Sunday at eight thirty, ten. And 11.30, and they're going to be Easter services. It's called Dying to Live, and we're going to look at how Christ's life brings life to us. And I think a lot of people right now in our culture are dying to live. We want to get out. We want to live our lives again, right? Well, Jesus has come where we can truly live the life he has called for us. That's next week. So we look forward to that. Go ahead and invite folks to come. And let me encourage you with something. Majority of people who don't normally come to church like to come on Sunday. If you guys could do me a big favor, if you come here normally, if you could come on Saturday and make room for those on Sunday, that would be fantastic. If you could do that, that'd be great. If you're inviting someone, invite people to come. Say, hey, listen, it's Easter. Love to have you come. Uh, which service do you want to go to? We have five of them. And tell them it's on Saturday at 3 and 4.30 and Sunday 8.30, 10, 11.30. If they want to come to all of them, I guess they can if they want to. So that's what's going on. Okay, everybody? Hey, let's get back into our series. We're going through called Unshakable and how to live an unshakable life in a shakable time. So that's what this whole series has been about, and it's basically a study of 1 Peter, and 1 Peter talks about how to live during persecution, how to live when things are going difficult, how to deal with situations. And, uh, and Peter was, wrote this book in about 30 to 50 A.D., and uh, the church was beginning to experience persecution at that time, but it started to ramp up during this time. And we talked about that in previous weeks. You can catch up at cornerstonecheshire.com, or you can go to uh, Spotify or iTunes and sign up, right, type Cornerstone Cheshire, and you can download the podcast. It will come each week to your mailbox. So we've been talking about First Peter and how to live during difficult times. Peter is an older man now. He was one of the original 12. He wrote this book to a scattered church all about. And, uh, and he's writing, how do we deal with difficult times happen? And right now around the world, there is persecution going on. There's persecution in North Korea. There's persecution happening in India. There's persecution in some African countries. In the continent of Africa, excuse me. In some of the countries that are happening there. There's things happening in Iran and other places. And so we have to realize just because we're not experiencing here does not mean it's not happening other places, but it is. And we can begin to see it's happening here a little bit more now. Things are rising up as we continue to do God's ways and the world goes the opposite direction. There's, there is a persecution that begins to rise. So this week we're going to talk about that. And what are we to do? And we've been talking about this, that uh, basically your actions spring up from what you believe about your identity. That was last week. Your actions spring up from what you believe about your identity. And last week, we took a great deal of time talking about what the Bible says who you are. You see, the enemy's job is to get us to believe a lie about ourselves. If the enemy can get you to believe a lie about your identity, then you live below what you're called to do. We talked about that last week. 
And we want to continue to remind ourselves what it's about. We mentioned, last week we said this. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. And we talked about last week, we want to encourage you to look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself who you are, that you are a chosen race, that you are graced and forgiven. You're God's possession, and you're a holy nation. Now, once you have that identity, what are you supposed to do with that identity? When you know who you are, you can become what you're called to do. And that's the next two verses in 1 Peter. We're going through the whole book line by line, verse by verse. He says here, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners. And by the way, beloved is a strong term of endearment. He's saying, you guys are important. I love you. God loves you. I urge you as sojourners and sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage a war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles. Those are non-believing people. Honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So what we're going to do is break down these two verses, and we're going to dissect it just a little bit and see what it has to say. First of all, he says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. We've been talking about that, that we are on a journey. This is not our home. And the only way you and I can really raise our expectations is we have to lower our expectations. Now, what is that supposed to mean? The only way you can raise your expectations is by lowering them. When you realize this is not heaven. This is not my home. I am only here temporarily. Now, how many of you have ever had, ever had some friends that maybe um, said, hey, make yourself at home? All right? Well, growing up, people were gracious enough to let us borrow their vacation home. And I don't like borrowing people's vacation home because you're walking on pins and needles the whole week. <laughs> right? You know, they say, make yourself at home. If someone says, make yourself at home, guess what they're doing to you? They're lying. <laughs> they don't mean it. If they really mean it, then go to the bedroom and open their drawers. Right? Open the refrigerator. Yeah, they don't mean it. Right? You know when you're in someone's house, it's hard to be yourself, right? And, and even if, like, if you're borrowing someone's vacation home, hopefully if you have any kind of decency, you're going to be very careful when you have little kids with you, right? Don't touch anything. Don't look at anything. My parents said, enough of borrowing people's vacation homes. We're done. We can't relax. Listen, everybody. This is our vacation home in a way. It doesn't feel like home because it's not. You can't really be yourself like you want to be because this is not our home. We're passing through. Doesn't mean we trash the hotels. We're like staying in the resident sin of the earth. It's a hotel, and we're trying to make it our home. And as, 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 as much as we try, there's something not right, right? Absolutely. And so when we begin to realize that, that this is not heaven and the better is, better is coming, you lower your expectations and as a result, you have higher expectations because you know where you're going. And this is the key to Christian living is you know for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. When we know what's ahead of us. So I urge you as soldiers and exiles. He said that in chapter 1. I just want to review. He called us elect exiles, that you've been elect. You are chosen. We mentioned last week that God has chosen you, and you chose to be chosen. In other words, he's choosing everybody, but whoever chooses to be chosen is chosen. Now, if that confuses you, go to last week. So those are elect exiles. And he talks about this, you, you're exiles. So again, he's reminding us, you are exiles. We're waiting for the com, um, culmination of all human history. When Christ comes back, he'll make everything right. Either we go to him or he'll come back. And this is when things are going to be better. And this is what he was saying throughout this letter. Now, I like what Tim Keller says. He's a great theologian and a pastor. 
uh, of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. It used to be at least. And this is what he says. There's a place at which you finally stop trusting in your morality and goodness and start trusting in what Christ has done for you. At that moment, you become a citizen of heaven and an alien to this world. I think he's absolutely correct. You see, the problem is, if you're living in a world sense, if you're doing your own thing and living like the world and getting involved with all things you shouldn't get involved with, that's one thing. But if you're also trying to live for God, trying to do all the right things and work for God and hope God loves you, both are worldly. If you're trying to earn God's favor, that's worldly. If you're living in the world, that's worldly. Well, what are you supposed to do? Stop. You can't. Hold me one second. This thing's driving me a little batty. All right, that should be a little better. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, this, this thing has been pulling on me. It's kind of driving me nuts. Okay, let's move back. Where was I? Oh, yes. When you act like the world, you're worldly. And when you try to be a Christian without God, you're being worldly. Both don't work. Both don't, both don't work. And so what God has called us to be is reliant upon him. He wants us to go with him through this process. He says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Now, what's the passions? Passions are things that are erupted inside of you. Now, no one around here ever has any passions for anything, correct? Not the final four, right? Passions for the flesh. That means the old nature, which wage war against your soul. Which wage war against your soul. That there's a war going on. Whether you realize it or not, there is a war going on. So, what do we got to do? Now that we know who you are, now we need to, to act out who we are. When you know your identity, you can truly become what you're called to be, right? And the Word of God says we must declare war and battle with God against our sinful nature. So here's the key, everybody. Here's the key. Declare war. It's time to declare war. It's time to stop making allowances and alliances with your old, well, that's just the way I am. No. You need to declare war and battle with God, not for God. Don't try to be a good Christian. It does not work. Don't try to earn God's favor. You cannot earn, what kind of, something like Popeye. You cannot earn his favor. We must... We must declare war and battle with God against our sinful nature. So we do it with God. We don't live for God. When you live for God, that's called religion. It's all about rules and regulations. When you live with God, then you're doing it with God. Big difference, everybody. Big difference. And so what we want to do is say, hey, God, I'm struggling right now. God, I am struggling right now with this situation. Lord, I really want to give into this temptation, but I, I know that the Bible says that greater is you that's within me than he that's in the world. So, God, I need your help. And God will say, go call a friend. Tell him you're going through a hard time. That's why we have the body of Christ. We're supposed to work with God, and part of working with God is being connected to a body. You're not called to be a nobody, but you're called to be in somebody, and that somebody is the body of Christ. And we work together with God and with the body. This is how we overcome. We can't overcome just by ourselves. We need to work together. So we must declare war. I'm going to war. And you and I should realize that. I'm going at war and you're at war. Let's work together. We must battle with God against our sinful nature. Now realize that some of the things we want to do are not necessarily bad. But what is this sinful nature? What is it? Well, our biggest and decisive battles always is fought with in first. The battle begins inside of you, everybody. Your biggest battle is you. Your biggest enemy is you. It's not the government. It's not even Satan. I hate to tell you. I like to blame Satan for everything. I like to blame God for everything. But the truth of the matter is, you are your own worst enemy, and you're also your best friend. And so what we have to realize is the battle begins in our mind. Yes, there's principality. Yes, there's spiritual forces in high places. But primarily, they do it through strongholds of thinking, giving you lies. And so our biggest, our biggest and decisive battles are always fought within us first. When you realize that, that's a huge, big deal. 
Absolutely. Your biggest problem is you, and the good news is God wants to deliver you with you. And this is part of the process. I like what C.S. Lewis says. He says this, We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside of us until we try to fight it. Right? It, I, I, don't, I have no problem with food until I try to lose weight. I, I have no problem being patient until I ask God to make me patient. I have no trouble in blaming the pandemic for everything until I stop trying to blame the pandemics for everything. What are we going to do when this pandemic's over? We can't blame it anymore. Right? So we'll never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside until we try to fight. This is why when you try to do the right thing, it's hard. Yes, of course it's that way because you're, you begin to recognize it. Actually, it's actually a blessing that it's hard. What? Because you actually are beginning to realize the real battle. And it takes a while at first. Now, the apostle Paul, what he does is he kind of fleshes out what Peter's talking about. This list of this godly, of the ungodly passions that are inside of you. The apostle Paul says this, when you follow the desires, this passion of your sin for your nature, your unredeemed nature. The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, the word pornonia comes to that, where we get the word pornography, which means sexual deviations. Listen, guys, God created sex. It was not a bad thing. But taking in the wrong way, utilized in the wrong capacity, is very damaging. We talked about electricity is great in its proper context. Out of its proper context, it causes trouble. Fire in its proper context is amazing. Out of a fireplace, you burn down houses and forest fires and cause California to lose all the great mansions they have out there, right? You're like, praise the Lord. Not stop it. Okay, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality impurity, being impure and everything you're doing, you're making things impure, I don't have time to break it down as much as I'd like to. Lustful pleasures, and that could be food or anything, where it's all about I have to have it now and I don't care what obstacles in the way, I'm going to find a way. That's lustful pleasures, idolatry. That means basically making things a God. It can be your job, it can be your kids, it can be your church. That's right. You can make church an idol and lose God then why are we in church? <laughs> Thank you for asking. Because hopefully we're encouraging you to rely on God, not just the church. It's always God first and then his body. Jesus is the head and then the body. Idolatry, sorcery, getting involved with witchcraft, tarot cards, meditation that, that are not upon God, getting involved with astrology and all this stuff. Guys, it's not good. Going to seances and trying to talk to your lost loved ones. People, a lot of people do that. Don't play with it. Yeah, but they knew. Of course they know. I can get on Google and know about your life. You don't think the enemy has Google? <laughs> There's a demon there. Gee, what's, what's fun about his parents? All he has to do is go to Facebook. We're making it easy for the enemy now. They can look at our old pictures, right? I'm joking, but seriously, everybody, don't get involved with that stuff. That is wicked and will, it will lead you down a path. That's what I was talking about. So, we must also batter, battle the COVID operations of our hearts. You see, what we do in intelligence and warfare, you send in the secret agents. You send in the 007s. You send in the get smarts. I'm going to date myself. And what you do is you go in there and you sabotage circumstances like Mission Impossible, where they go in and uh, Peter Graves... And now, Tom, now, it's, now it's not Tom Selleck, it's Tom Cruise, okay? And they go in and they mess with the governments, they put on fake masks, and they try to get things to happen to create chaos so they can come in and make real damage. Well, there's COVID operations going on inside of you. You know what your COVID, COVID operations are? Things that are too important to us. That ourself, you, you can't trust yourself. For example, I like church to be this. I want everyone in church to look like me, have the same salary as me, have the same kids as me, right? I don't want any diversity. I don't want to go to that church because of those people. Or those people think they're all high-minded. That could be one of them. Or whatever it could be. Or maybe it could be, I think church should be a place where it's blah, 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 blah. Or it could be whatever it is. Well, your preferences become so important to you that it literally becomes almost like a it kind of it becomes something you go after to the point where it's unhealthy. 
And that, my friends, is the COVID operations. That's why churches split over the style of music. Churches split over silly things. They're wearing a tie. Do you know, everybody, that ties, I just want to let you know, there was a time where people wore ties. They thought it was of the devil. Do you know why? Because it pointed down. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. You know John Calvin, the great church reformer, not Calvin Jeans, okay? John Calvin, 1500s. Do you know what happened to him? You know what he called the, you know what he called the pipe organ? You know the pipe organ that, that's in the real high churches? He called it the bagpipes of the devil, <laughs> okay? People killed each other for being baptized, the Anabaptists, and they dunked them down and killed them because they, they thought what they were doing was wrong. I mean, stuff like that. That's when we covet operations of our own hearts. We fight over things that don't matter, everybody. The only thing that's worth fighting over is Jesus Christ and the Bible. And all. I'm not going to fight over a preference. I'm not going to fight over a mask or no mask. I'm not going to fight over what political party. No, we will stand for Christ. So things that are too important to us, everybody. I think we've seen a lot of that happen this past year. Have you guys noticed that just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. And what we're going to ask God is this. God, search me, oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know thy thoughts and see if there's anything grievous way in me and lead me in the everlasting. So what do we got to do? Our biggest and decisive battles are always fought within us first. Also with that battle, the second battle is how we interact with our relationship with other people. So we deal with our own passions, but look at the rest of this list the Apostle Paul gives us, works of the flesh, which Peter also is alluding to, is hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger. All these have to do with other people. I heard someone say, I'd love the church if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> it's, like telling your, it's like telling your spouse, I love you except for your body. That doesn't work too good. I don't recommend it. The body is the church of Jesus Christ, okay? So hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And remember, this is not a list that we try not to do so God accepts us. When you give your life to Christ, there should be a change inside of you. You should start wanting to swim in a different type of water. You should want to have a different desires. If your desires don't change, then you got to ask yourself, have I really given my life to Christ? So I don't want us getting lost with behavior. Behavior doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Jesus saves you for good behavior. You, when you trust God, you start doing things his way. When you do things his way, your life goes better because you're made that way. And he knows how you're made. He knows how society is made. All right? So this is how we do it. So we must declare war and battle with God against our sinful nature. That's what we, we're in, we're in a battle, everybody. And the second point for today is this. We must choose to do right when we are wronged. We must choose to do right when we are wronged. Talks about that in 1 Corinthians. Christians suing each other in the court of law. Being a bad witness to other people. People acting horrific. Let yourself be mishandled. What are you talking about? I have to get my rights. Why did you do that? Well, because she did it first. I mean, have, did we not all learn this from childhood? Right? Two wrongs make a right. Right? No, two wrongs don't make a what? They don't. And so just because someone does something does not give us a license to do it. We always got to do the right thing. So we must choose to do the right thing when we are wrong. Here it goes in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you, for back to 1 Peter, as sojourners, as exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul, right? Here's the second part. The first part is go to war. The second point today is this, is do the right thing when you're wronged. And here it is. Keep your conduct, which means behavior, among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evil doers they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation and by the way it's not something new when you do something good they call you evil have you noticed that what's now good is called evil and now what they call evil is they say is good yeah you see, this, this is not something new this has been happening a long time in fact <laughs> Not a, I don't know who, if he's a believer or not, but this is what he said. George Orwell said this. The further a society drifts from the truth, 
the more it will hate those who speak it. It's the truth. When you and I speak the truth and the world goes some other direction, they're going to hate what we say. That's why people are fighting against these things. And we're talking about having war against the flesh. You notice there's a war against everything. There's a war against poverty, which is great. War against cancer, which is great. War against racism, which is great. All these wars, right? War against this, war against women, war against Republicans, war against Democrats. And I'm not, I'm not going to mention politics, but I just did. But there's a war, right? Everything is a war. Everything is a war. Why not war against the things inside of you instead? That maybe you'll be able to deal with somebody else. You know what Jesus talks about that, by the way. What does he say? First take the what? Speck. No, take, said, take the log out of your eye first. Then you'll be able to deal correctly and help your brother. So, so what we see happen. So if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. This is Jesus. Okay, get over it. People are not going to like us. Because what happens is when you start doing the right thing. Now, by the way, this does not give you a license to be a jerk. Now, my wife got upset last time I said jerk, but sometimes Christians act like we do. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> I almost quit the church because of church Christians. And then I realized I was part of the problem. Okay? But the world hates you. Listen, don't act bad and blame your faith in Christ. I'm talking about when you're doing the right thing in your attack. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. This is Jesus speaking. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so the world hates you. All right, this is what Jesus says. And he says here, by the way, he goes on in John 15. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than its master. Since then, what do you mean, pastor? He said, Jesus is for slaves? No, that's for next week. Don't cancel Jesus yet, okay? A slave is not a greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. If they had listened to me, they would listen to you. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, he tells us to God, uh, in a prayer to his disciples, which is you and I, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. And this is the, this is the illustration I want to help you understand for a moment. You ever hear of whales and dolphins? They're called what? Mammals. Why? They're warm-blooded, they have a vertebrae, and they breathe. They breathe a different climate than the ocean that they're in. So all the other fish, a lot of them are cold-blooded. So they take on the environment that they're there, and they breathe from the oxygen that's in the water, while a whale or a dolphin, what they have to do is they have to blow to the, they have to go to the top, blow out the junk, right? And they have to breathe in the fresh atmosphere of a different world to go to the world of the sea. And they have to constantly go back up. Have you noticed that? They can't live too long without getting that other other atmosphere in them. Same with us. You and I live in a different world. We should breathe and eat on a different world. So if you think, if you continue to stay in this world and don't go to the top and blow out the trash and bring in the new atmosphere of heaven so you and I can swim in the ocean of the world. We're in the ocean, but we're not of the ocean. While fish are of the ocean, they take the temperature of the ocean, they act like the ocean, they live off the ocean. No, we live in a different economy. Though we're in the world, we're not of the world, just like a whale. That's why we, that's part of it, hopefully coming to church is like going to the top and blowing out and breathing in, reading your word every day, encouraging each other. That's all part of it. So back to what Peter was saying. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, non-believers, honorable. Honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So do the right thing. There have been people that we've seen where we've done the right thing for a number of years. And they go, I don't like that person. He's a Christian. But I'll tell you one thing. They're serious about what they talk about. I mean, I, I know some Muslims. They, they pray three times a day. They, they're good people. And you know, I don't, may not agree with their religion. But guess what? They're nice people. They have a good family. That's a testimony. Now, they're believing the wrong way. But they're living right. We should be better than that actually so you know I don't this is I don't agree with what they agree with, but man they live a good life they, they do what they say they're gonna do they come early and they stay late at work oh yeah they don't cheat on online school oh 
Yeah, but everyone's getting A's in school, and I, I got a D. Yeah, you didn't cheat. Yeah, but it's not fair. Nah, do the right thing. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. All these types of things that happen, right? So they see your good deeds, and they glorify God on the day of visitation. By the way, Jesus talks about that. Peter is quoting Jesus, because Jesus says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your what? Good works. Remember, we're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works in a relationship with Christ. There's a vast difference between the two. Okay? So, give glory to God your Father who is in heaven. A number of years ago, uh, my parents, my dad was a pastor of a Presbyterian church. I have nothing against Presbyterians or Libertarians, no. Or vegetarians, okay? They're all very, okay. Well, let me, let me tell you what happened. So my dad was a pastor of a church, and uh, my, my dad was kind of a, for, a forerunner in the uh, mainline churches. He would preach the gospel, and people would get saved, and we'd have 200 people in the church, and 200 people gave, gave a life to Christ because no one knew who God was. And then he introduced to them the power of the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, People began to speak in spiritual language. People began to lay hands on the sick, and they were recovering. Cool things were happening, but he did it respectfully. We had a youth pastor. Kids went away in a retreat. The kids came back on fire for Jesus, and they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They began to have spiritual gifts. It was wonderful. So what happened was the board, the, the, uh, the big honcho said, hey, listen, you need to fire him. Fire who? The youth pastor. Why? Well, what they're doing is not right. Oh, and he goes, well, he's just following scripture. I can't follow him. If you don't fire him, you're next. My dad says, I will not fire him. Then came the witch hunt. Then they tried to gain a thing against my dad. They collected data. They tried to find stuff. And my dad was being maligned. My family was being maligned. And I hated every minute of it. I was angry at my father for not fighting back. I wanted my father to fight. He would not fight. He just, just, he just kept his cool and did the right thing. Meanwhile, I wanted to, you know, my family wanted to. In fact, I started hating church because I saw church as an attacking mechanism against me and my family. But my father stayed the course, did the right thing. Did the, he just would not relent. I'm sorry. With all due respect, I have to answer to God more than I have to answer to you. And this is the word of God. I will not fire the youth pastor. He's done nothing wrong. And some, one of the board members said, well, listen, I'd rather have my daughter on drugs than be filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what happened to the daughter? She went on drugs and lost her mind. Started messed with PCP. Uh, and she, I mean, it's very sad. Careful what you say. So my father uh, was basically thrown out of the church. And uh, we start, another church was started by the folks. But nevertheless, uh, 35 years go by. And the very person that was the board member, there was another board member that throwed nails in our driveway. And gave, I mean, it was bad. <laughs> it was bad. Church people can be kind of nasty sometimes because they're not, the, they're not in the church. And, and so what happened was, uh, as uh, my friend Tom, Pastor Tom Bucket told me a joke, I'm gonna, can I just tell you a quick joke, even though we're running out of time? Okay. Uh, someone, one time someone comes up and says, hey, does your dog bite? He goes, my dog does not bite. And then the, the dog bites him. He said, I thought you said that wasn't your dog. I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. He goes, it's not my dog. <laughs> I said it wrong. Well, they're not my sheep. Sometimes a nasty, Jesus cast out demons in church, by the way. Yeah. So anyhow, it was bad. So 35 years go on. We're at a Christian camp, and the elder, the big head honcho guy that had the control of the entire church came to my father with his wife with tears in her eyes asking, will you forgive us? We were wrong. You were right. We see that you stood up for the truth. We saw what happened. And because of my parents' integrity, my parents prayed for them, and they had reconciliation. It took 35 years. But because of the good works, they glorified God. You may not see it in this lifetime, everybody. It's always right to do the right thing. Listen, one day God will pay you for it. And one day during judgment, people are going to say, you know what? They did the right thing. That's what we got to do. So in the same way, let your light shine before others that they would see your good works 
and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. I'm going to ask the worship team to make them way up, please. So, the big points today, here it is. We must declare war and battle with God against our sinful nature. Have you declared war? Not against yourself, but against your sinful nature. Knowing that God loves you and he wants to help you through the process. Anytime you start feeling, I'm so, I'm so horrible. What kind of Christian am I? I might as well give up. I'm no good. I can never be anything. That's not the voice of God. That's the voice of religion called the enemy who's going to try to, just, to slice you and dice you through religion. While what, what God will say to you through the Holy Spirit, hey, listen, what you did is wrong, but you can do better. Come on, get it right. Let's work together. You can get back up. You can make it. Yeah, you, you, you got drunk again. Yeah, you blew up again. Yeah, you got involved with that again. Yeah, you gave him to that sexual temptation again. But you know what? I have better days for you. Get up. Come on. Get help from the body. Don't just talk about it to yourself. Go tell somebody in the body. Get prayed for in the body. And you can get through this. That's the Holy Spirit working together with God to help you to get over something. So that's the battle we have, everybody. So anytime you want to beat yourself up, it's not God. If you want to say, you know what, I could do better. You can cry, you can be upset, but there should be a call to get it right. So we must declare war and battle with God against our sinful nature. And number two, we must choose to do right when we are wronged. Maybe you need to drop that lawsuit against your ex. Oh, maybe you need to not do that situation. Maybe you need to, maybe that next door neighbor that you want to sue Maybe, maybe you should talk to your brother or your sister-in-law that you haven't spoken to in five or ten years because of the inheritance and all the argument over that. I don't know where you're at today, but it's always right to do the right thing. Are you able to be wronged so you can be right? Why not be wronged and love God and let God deal with it? Listen, I didn't like it growing up, but guess what happened? It was the better solution. So I want to encourage you today. It's time to go to war with God and his body. Don't fight these battles alone and choose to do the right thing. And God will honor you and people will honor you one day. If not here, they'll see it in heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity today. I thank you for your word. It's just a light into our path. God, I want to thank you that... Uh, you're calling us to go to war with the stuff inside of us, oh God. And Lord, we understand that we can't do it without you, God. We don't want to do this without you, God. We don't want to try to earn your favor because we can't. But we want to work with you, God. And Lord, we realize that working with you means that we need to work with the body that we're part of. And so Lord, I would pray that we would no longer make excuses that we go to war against these areas of our lives. Thank you all the while you love us and you want us to set us free. Lord, I also pray that we would do the right thing no matter what. That we would do the right thing, that we would trust your word, knowing your word will not return void. Knowing doing your word and having integrity is the right thing to do. Not embezzling funds, but reporting the income that we have. Not fudging expense accounts to pat our own pockets. Oh God, let us be different. Let us be of you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Jesus said this to us in John 16, 33. He says this. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You want to have peace? Yeah. In this world you will have tribulation, but take Heart, I have overcome the world. The only way you're going to be, over, be able to overcome all these circumstances and not be shaken, have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about the Christian philosophy. I'm talking about resigning from being in charge of your life. I'm talking about saying, it's not my life anymore, God. It's your life. Have you done that? If you haven't, you're not saved. And if, if you don't care anymore, then I wonder if you ever made the right decision. Today is the day to get right. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know we're running out of time here, but I want you to pray this prayer with me in your heart. If you've never given your life to Christ or you've walked so far away and you just came today, you stumbled online today, 
And you know what, what, what I've been sharing with you? It's like, it's like I've been talking about you the whole time. I have not been talking about you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking through me to you because I'm speaking the word of the Lord. If you'd like to give your life to Christ for the very first time, what he asks you to do is surrender. Admit you're wrong and surrender and accept. If you want to do it, pray this prayer with me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, go ahead in your own way. Lord Jesus, you can pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all the things I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down from my own life. This is not my life. It is now yours. I invite you to come into my life in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again. And Jesus says, come follow me. Not just one prayer and that's it. No, come follow him. In the front pocket of your seat, uh, there is a card called a connection card. You can fill it out. Say, I'm committing my life to Christ today for the first time. If you're online, you can do it as well. We, um, you can do it here as well through our, our phone number. We have a phone number up there. If you guys could put it up there. Do we have it now? No, the other one. There it is. To follow Jesus, text 860-499-4888. Just go to your phone. Go to... 860-499-4888 and just write believe. That's it. And you'll get some prompts for the next steps. At the end of the service today, we have folks at the front desk. You can uh, get a Bible. We have people up front if you need prayer for any reason at all. Okay, everybody? We want to help you in this process. We're all in this together. Also, we have an opportunity to give back to what God has given to us. We want to thank you for trusting God. You know, I've seen God take care of our family through many, many years, from my grandparents to my parents, now in my own life, I'm seeing it happening. When I trust God, when I give Him 10%, when I am generous, when I realize everything I have is not mine, you don't have to give. You get to give. So there's are four ways you can do it. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire 77977, push pay app, cornerstonecheshire.com. You can mail it to the church address, or as you walk out of here, if you're in here, most of you are right now, you can put it in the boxes. Thank you so much, guys. God bless you. Remember, Easter is next week. Good Friday, we're having a prayer at noon, and then in the evening, we're having an online worship time of remembrance that you can participate in. And then Saturday, 3 and 4.30 p.m., and then Sunday, 8, 30, 10, and 11. And today also is Grove Track at 1. A lot of announcements. God bless you guys. One thing I want to say. I want to say a blessing over you. In the name of Jesus Christ, be blessed with strength, with grace, with forgiveness. Know that you can do all things through Christ, with Christ, and for Christ. Walk in the power of strength. Go to war with the things in your life, knowing that God is with you and choose to do the right thing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you guys, and we'll talk to you soon.